Um, so uh, um, I currently work for uh, IOActive, and I've spent uh, the last five years doing uh, SCADA research, uh, pen testing uh, um, chunks of the critical infrastructure um, across a lot of the different sectors, um, electric power, uh, water, chemical, um, that type of stuff. And I don't often get a chance to speak to security researchers, so uh, um, sometimes I don't have a really good feel for what's background knowledge everybody knows in the in the process control space and what uh, um, what people don't know. So kind of as a uh, um, as a show of hands, how many people here uh, have played with SCADA gear or um, uh, know what SCADA systems are, that type of stuff? So we have a few. Uh, anybody programmed a PLC? Okay, we've got a few. Um, how many people know what a PLC is? Oh, okay, same few. Okay, so uh, um, we'll go into a little bit of depth as I, as I go along, and if you're, you're lost and uh, um, you don't understand some of the terminology, then by all means, speak up and interrupt me, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll cover it a little bit. So SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Um, so in the uh, computer security world, then everything's referred to as a SCADA system. Um, if you go out into uh, the process control world, uh, SCADA is a very narrow chunk of software, but it all really hacks the same. So in computer security, we call absolutely everything a SCADA system. So uh, if you're out in process control, they'll refer to, uh, to process as a PCS, a process control system, a DCS, a distributed control system, and they're really the same pieces cobbled together in a bunch of different ways. So uh, what do we know about SCADA? Um, SCADA systems control physical systems. So if you have a, a computer that actually does something in the real world, it's generally a SCADA system. Um, so uh, if a valve's opening, a switch is, uh, a switch is closing, pumps are kicking on and off, um, smoke's coming out of stuff, then probably you just hacked into and controlled a SCADA system. So uh, uh, SCADA systems come in two, uh, two flavor, flavors, supervisory control and momentary control. Um, so traditionally, a SCADA is supervisory control. And how you tell the difference most of the time is if you uh, uh, came over there and you had a big bomb and you dropped it on top of the, uh, the SCADA system. It goes poof, the building's gone, everything's gone. On a SCADA system, since it's supervisory control, all the field equipment continues to work in its last program state uh, until you know, something happens and it can't deal with it um, and, uh, and shuts down. In a momentary control system, uh, the computers are in constant control of the process. So uh, if you're like mixing batches of chemicals and that type of stuff, it's more of a momentary control system. The computer says, turn on the pump right now, run it for 30 seconds, turn off the pump right now um, on a system. So first, um, we're gonna do a little bit of SCADA versus the movies. So uh, one of the uh, big problems with being a uh, SCADA researcher is uh, Hollywood has been uh, um, taking liberties with, uh, with SCADA hacking for, for years and years. So uh, if you go watch a lot of movies, then uh, some evil hackers usually, you know, hacking in using a, uh, using a computer and running off and, and killing people with, uh, um, uh, with their evil hacker skills. So uh, as a result, almost everybody has some idea of, of SCADA hacking, um, even if they're not a hacker at all. And a lot of those ideas are kind of questionable. So we're gonna start off with a little bit of SCADA versus the movies. So there's a lot of myth versus legend uh, about SCADA. So I'll start it off with the big uh, uh, announcement by uh, whichever admiral actually did it. There's gonna be a digital Pearl Harbor. People are gonna hack in, control our infrastructure. Everything's gonna blow up. You know, the world will end and, and uh, um, terror and uh, uh, everything will reign. Um, so more, more recently, we've, uh, we've had uh, um, uh, ranking members of, uh, of Congress saying terrorists can take down the nation anytime. Uh, one of them actually said, now I have to fear my toaster, um, but I really don't think the toaster is going to kill you anytime soon. So I think the toaster is, is really out. So let's have a little bit of a reality check. So uh, first, the movies. So uh, these are all copyright by whoever actually made the movies. So uh, I will give a nod to them and, uh, and thank you for your, uh, thank you for your, your good work. So uh, I actually did not see Live Free or Die Hard until, uh, until very recently. I just get, kept getting so many emails into, uh, into my inbox. It's like, oh, did you see Live Free or Die Hard? You know, that was like the, the awesome SCADA hacking movie. And, and uh, um, so eventually I had to go see it. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's start with a, uh, a couple of things. I'm going to have to flip back and forth because, uh, um, because uh, I'm having DRM issues with, uh, with some of my clips and whatnot. Um. <laughs> Yes, DRM is evil. So let me grab this real quick, and let's see what the movie says. The 
Not everything is run completely online. Uh, uh, but your utilities are. Um, so, but not everything is run completely online. Uh, uh, but your utilities are. They're run by closed circuits, so you could breach the security up to a certain point, but um, to shut it down, you'd have to physically go there. You'd have to show up, right? And and uh, you know what? Give me that guy's PDA. Yeah. So uh, pretty much what the what in live, live free or die hard would have you believe is that uh, um, all the uh, core electric utilities are actually connected. Um, via these uh, these closed circuit cables and they don't touch the internet at all. So if you're going to go and uh, go hack the power grid, you have to uh, fly a helicopter and do a whole bunch of gymnastics and go uh, go fly in and uh, um, and uh, and and uh, fire a lot of guns and whatnot. Um, that's really not the case. So uh, this is my finger paint print, uh, my finger paint uh, version of how electric utilities are hooked together. So uh, typically, and this is pretty typical of a lot of SCADA systems out there. So typically, you've got a control network. Um, the control network is where all the computers live that actually turn stuff on and off. Um, this is the heart and soul of an electric utility or a chemical plant or whichever industry you're, you're actually in. Um, almost always, there's a firewall off to uh, a business network, and that's where everybody sits that, uh, that does the normal uh, accounting functions, um, secretary, CEOs, all those types of uh, guys, um, send out bills, that type, uh, that type of stuff. In electric power, you also have a regional coordinator. Um, in electric power, then uh, the, each uh, generator has to generate more electricity that it can actually sell. And if you don't, the power grid's not, uh, not stable. So uh, um, nobody really wants to generate all of the extra power because generating power that nobody's going to buy is expensive. So you have a regional coordinator and uh, they take care of a lot of the issues like balancing the power and saying you've got to ramp up a little bit more than you want to uh, to keep the, uh, the power grid stable. Um, and then utilities have to balance power between themselves. So, uh, um, so generally you have a control uh, and, uh, network link from the control network of one utility across the lease line or across the internet out to a control network on the uh, um, a control network on the, a neighboring utility. And actually the first time that uh, people were really convinced that this didn't go over closed circuit was actually uh, an incident uh, where uh, um, it was a uh, government controlled utility um, and they had instituted a new red, yellow, green alert system that said, uh, um, hey, uh, uh, when worms are coming out, we have these internet alerts. And what we're going to do is take our utility um, and unplug it from the internet. That way, the, the evil, nasty worms spreading across the internet aren't going to invade our utility. So they went over there and unplugged, uh, unplugged themselves from the net and lost control of, uh, of a, lot of their, uh, a lot of their generation and uh, were no longer able to balance the power between the two. So they traced it all back through and, and sure enough, um, after a few hops, the, uh, um, the data went out, out, out across the internet to, uh, to the neighboring utility. So if you had to design a protocol to hook all these utilities together, then uh, you would uh, sit down and generate uh, the, uh, the most uh, um, bulletproof protocol. You'd make it really, really well thought out and uh, easy to debug and easy to understand and all that good stuff, right? Well, uh, no, this is, uh, this is actually a protocol. It's known as ICCP or TASI.2. And this is the protocol that interlinks um, uh, utilities. So uh, there was a bunch of uh, debate when the protocol was being, uh, w was being generated. Um, some of the debate was uh, uh, some of the guys were hooked up via serial links from utility to utility. So we want to run over just serial uh, as a serial protocol. A bunch of the guys that chaired the committee were uh, um, actually on the standards committee for the ISO networking stack. So they really, really wanted it to run over the ISO stack. And everybody else wanted TCP IP. So here's really what you got up. Uh, Here's what, really what you got when you uh, stuck all this together instead of having a, a nice sane, uh, sane stack. Then uh, at the bottom, you've got a traditional TCP IP stack um, that everybody knows and loves, bound to port 102 and, uh, and is listening. Then you have a little bit of RFC 1006 glue. This is just a few headers um, that are used to translate uh, data between um, the ISO stack and the TCP IP stack. On top of that, you have one or more or lots or none of the ISO layers of the, uh, um, of the ISO stack. On top of that, you run a complete MMS stack, uh, basically a serial networking stack if you're not familiar with it. Um, and then on top of that, you run TASI.2. TASI.2 is its own protocol or on top of the MMS, sorry. Then you have ASN.1 decoding. Um, and uh, everybody knows that we've never ever had a bug in ASN.1 encoding. And uh, on top of that, you have TASI.2, which is a, a block-based protocol with a bunch of message sections where you can say, give me a whole bunch of points, give me a whole bunch of values. 
Um, inside uh, TASI.2, then you have uh, um, you have memo fields, and uh, a lot of uh, Enlighten utilities now run inside those memo, memo fields XML. So you have this great big transport layer that uh, um, transfers back and forth a bunch of data and a bunch of XML blobs. Um, so it's the the most complex um, and uh, um, this most the complex and and buggy network protocol stack I think that has ever been designed in the entire world. Um, so. Uh, um, so I, I believe the record for the uh, for the implementation of a uh, uh, of an ICCP stack uh, against a fuzzer is just a couple of hours. Um, so uh, you fuzz these things, they crash all over the place. So uh, let's hit the uh, kind of the uh, the next uh, uh, the next thing that Holly would have would have you believe. So, uh, um, so, uh, um, so another thing, uh, and this is uh, sneakers is kind of an old movie, um, but even way back then, then uh, you had the concept that uh, all of the uh, um, all of these critical pieces of infrastructure were stuck together in some sort of heavily encrypted uh, manner. That you have a kind of military strength encryption that's uh, that's protecting the infrastructure. You have to break through the military grade encryption in order to get onto the uh, the SCADA network and actually do any uh, do anything to it. Um, so we've had a bunch of uh, of, of recent incidents. I'm going to kind of run through these in case anybody hasn't. Uh, um, isn't aware of them. So on the uh, the very lowest end, um, we've actually had disruption from just JavaScript port scanners. Um, so uh, web-based services have traditionally not been um, available on uh, on your uh, SCADA network. They're uh, the bastion of uh, um, kind of the old Unixes. So uh, some of the common operating systems, if you're looking at, uh, at power, you've got uh, VMS and True64 among your more common operating systems. You still see IRIX. Um, out in uh, out out in various industries, um, so Windows, uh, Linux, that type of stuff is just starting to creep into uh, creep into existence. And uh, another thing is just starting to creep into existence is web browsers actually on your control network. Um, so uh, they're hitting uh, mostly help systems right now. So uh, when the operator's up there, he wants to play with his software, come over there, look at. Uh, Look up something in the help system. A lot of the help systems now are are web based, so there's a reason for a web browser to be out on the the uh, SCADA network. But if you give the operators web browsers, a lot of times they'll figure out how to abuse those and run out and uh, look at dancing bears out on the internet. And so there's been several uh, cases lately of JavaScript scans taking out processes. Um, so uh, um, what happened is uh, also with all the embedded controllers we have there to make them really, really easy to uh, to configure and nice to work with. We've taken all of the nice little embedded controllers and we put web servers on them. So uh, um, if you have uh, your PLCs out there right now, a lot of times you can uh, you can browse to them. They show up a nice graphical display of all the cards that are in them. You can drill down. You can see the points. Um, sometimes you can play with the points. You can reset it. It's all really easy to use. Um, what's happened in, in some of those, the web servers really aren't that industrial strength. Um, so uh, people have just gone out to dancingbears.com, uh, got back a bunch of JavaScript port scanning uh, code in their, uh, in their web browser, and that comes over there, starts scanning through the, uh, the RFC address range. It finds the embedded controllers, uh, sends a whole bunch of JavaScript to it to try and attack it, and uh, the, the web server turns over and takes out the process along with it. Um, we do have four uh, cases of extortion. Um, so uh, when uh, with all the FUD that's running around, everybody's saying, you know, everybody's going to take down, there's going to be cyber war, all that fun stuff. The people that actually have uh, have penetrated, uh, the first penetrators of SCADA systems that were actually malicious people are actually extortion cases. Um, so in all four cases, um, all four of them non-US, then uh, 
Um, people have hacked in, hacked through all the firewalls, um, all the layers of stuff, gotten onto the control network, um, stuck a file there. I said, "Hey, I'm here, and if you don't want me to take down your, uh, don't want me to take down your power, you have to pay me a whole lot of money." Um, and so uh, the people have hacked in, and paying the people off is much cheaper than having your power down for a long time. And so the extortionists are really the pioneers of getting into the uh, getting into the control systems, um, or at least the the public pioneers of getting into the control systems. Um, last month, uh, over at the Scan SCADA Summit, then uh, Tom Donahue of the CIA um, actually uh, kind of cracked one of the uh, the seals. Um, one of the problems you have is, uh, since it's kind of critical infrastructure, there's very little you can say about specific incidences. Um, you can talk about them in general. A lot of times you have to scrub the name or exactly what happened. And uh, by the time it actually comes out in the press, you get this press release that says, bad stuff happened to somebody somewhere. You should be afraid. Um, and that's not really very, very useful when you're sitting back here with your firewall saying, okay, which port should I close? Where are they? And you just have no idea. Um, so uh, uh, Donahue from the CIA actually uh, came out and uh, um, drew up on the board, say, uh, his uh, kind of ladder of badness in SCADA. He's, he says, oh, people think about SCADA, you know, people know about SCADA, people keep hacking into SCADA, all the way down to people have caused blackouts and, and damage. And so he did come clean to say that uh, somewhere in the world that uh, people had hacked in from the internet, taking control of a, uh, of a power system and shut the power out in two cities in, in that attack. So uh, we do have now publicly confirmed evidence that uh, SCADA hackers are out there and they did turn off the power in at least two cities at least once. Um, so uh, if you're looking at kind of the public incident uh, response type stuff, people are hacking into it. Um, in all cases, the extortion cases and the, uh, um, uh, and the, uh, the other cases, um, there's kind of this perception that since it happened overseas that uh, um, people in non-US countries can't defend their networks properly. But in all cases, these networks actually had proper defenses. They had uh, proper firewalls with well-maintained rules, um, IDSs, all of the major defenses that you would uh, come, to, uh, come to expect from, uh, expect from uh, a computer security uh, program. So the attackers hacked in, hacked through all the defenses from the internet to the SCADA LAN, um, Sent up a uh, sent out a bunch of uh, commands to the field equipment and did did shut down the power in two cities. So uh, um, here's the uh, here's kind of one of the next ones that's a little bit interesting because it's a little bit counterintuitive. So in this one, then uh, um, uh, Hollywood, uh, uh, Hollywood says you can you know, flip a few buttons, send a whole bunch of gas someplace, and uh, lots and lots of explosion go, go, uh, go pop all over the place. And uh, um, let's see. You um, so uh, relief valves work really well in modern systems. It's, uh, it's really hard to make things, uh, make things blow up. Um, but this one actually has a little bit of basis in fact. This is from uh, testimony before, uh, um, before Congress, and this is actually the first known SCADA attack, um, according to the uh, testimony before Congress. Um, it said that in June of 1982, a huge explosion occurred in the Siberian wilderness of the former Soviet Union, and the yield was estimated at uh, three kilotons. Um, it had been planted on the host with uh, software by a foreign intelligence service. Um, so pretty much what happened, uh, uh, what happened on this one was uh, um, during, the, uh, during the constructions, then uh, a Trojan was stuck in the control system software, um, and the, uh, the pipeline was, was mostly empty. Um, the Trojan kicked on the motors and ran the motors until they overheated. That overheat caused enough, uh, um, caused enough, uh, um, enough heat to ignite the gas, uh, um, to ignite the gas air mixture inside the pipeline, and the pipeline blew up in a in a three kiloton explosion, which was filmed from space. Um, so there actually are uh, um, nice uh, nice photos of the uh, of the explosion. So this is actually the first known SCADA attack, where it's a cyber attack on a physical assist system, was back in 1982. 
So uh, let's get into just a little bit more of the nuts and bolts. Um, we won't get down to, uh, to SCADA exploits in, uh, in this presentation, but uh, um, just as kind of a conceptual framework, um, a lot of times uh, when you uh, see security announcements, especially at, uh, at conferences like this, um, people come over there and say, uh, um, say, you know, I have a bug in this software. This software is some, let's just say Oracle. Oracle is sometimes used in SCADA systems, therefore it's a SCADA exploit. I rule the world, let's all, uh, um, let's all go and be happy. Um, but uh, um, SCADA attacks generally fi follow a, a five-stage um, five stage hit. So the first one is access to the SCADA LAN. And this is something that, uh, um, as computer security people, we all know and love. You've got to hack through whatever GUI you've got to get to to finally get onto the process control LAN and, uh, and get a foothold there. Um, and this is actually really not too bad. Um, in, most pen, uh, in most cases, pen testers have been able to, with enough, uh, um, with enough effort, hack onto the SCADA LAN. Um, the second stage is actually discovery. Um, and you have to go through discovery because let's just say that you wanted to build uh, talcum powder plants. And you go and grab 10 engineers and say, 10 engineers, you've got unlimited budgets, go build me talcum powder plants. Each of those engineers will actually build you 10 separate talcum powder plants um, with different control systems. They'll configure them differently. They have different styles about them. And so when you hack onto a, uh, um, a SCADA LAN, you don't uh, instantly know where all of the big red buttons are. You don't know how it's stuck together. You don't know how it functions. Um, you don't know what chemical or electrical processes are in place and how they're implemented. So discovery is the phase where you go find all of that out. Um, this is actually the hardest, uh, uh, the hardest phase for an attacker because um, there's no real good blueprint for it. Because if you're uh, a legitimate person or a legitimate engineer that have ac has access to it, you go up to the guy that designed it and say, hey, how does this work? Give me a tour of your plant and he walks you through, shows you how everything works. So, uh, um, so discovery is, is actually the hardest part. The um, third part is actually the easiest part, control. Um, on the control of the system, then uh, the, uh, the actual controllers that control the physical hardware, um, by and large, take any properly formatted command. Uh, most of the time, they have no authentication. So as long as you properly format a command and throw it out the controller, the controller will act on that command and turn something on and off um, uh, at, uh, at a whim. So the, uh, the next stage is kind of a, is kind of a new stage. Um, the damage stage is after you have control of the system, um, it's trying to figure out how you're going to hurt the process, depending on how, uh, depending on what your goals are. If your goals are just to shut it down, damage is actually pretty easy. You go to the controller, you say, how many digital points do you have? It'll say, I've got 720 digital points. Let's set them all to zero. That'll turn it off. If you want to do something, uh, something more to the, uh, to the process, you've got to, you've got to experiment with the system, figure out how to damage the system. Because a lot of times, even the engineer that designed and built the plant doesn't know the maximum extent of the damage that can be done. And the last stage is cleanup. That's, uh, that's if you care. Um, and cleanup in a, uh, in a skate attack is geared more towards misdirection than, uh, than removing logs. So in a, uh, in a normal cyber attack, you hack onto somebody's network, you compromise a whole lot of stuff, you do whatever you want to do, and then when you leave, you erase all the logs. I was just never here. Well, you can't pretend uh, if, you, uh, um, if you cause, a, say, a tank to overflow in some, in some factory, that the tank didn't overflow in the factory. So cleanup in SCADA, uh, SCADA attacks is more about misdirections. It's coming up with a, uh, uh, a reason why the tank overflowed. Uh, so some of the things that, uh, that get done are um, a machine will get bricked or uh, um, some other piece of software will be, re -mis uh, will be misconfigured by the, uh, by the attacker to make it look like um, you know, just a stupid engineer did something stupid and had a bad, uh, had a bad result. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about maximizing damage today. It's, uh, it's one of the topics that hasn't really been covered in the, uh, in, in the public very much. Um, so uh, is, the, uh, is the damage phase. And so uh, most of the public research out there is, is, is on access. How do you hack into and get onto the SCADA LAN? Um, and so uh, there's not much known that's uh, about how to go about maximizing a damage once, once you've achieved uh, control. So I'm going to run into just a little bit of that today. Um, so we have uh, um, big equipment versus little equipment. Um, big equipment in uh, large installation is actually generally easier to physically damage than small equipment that you have on your laptop, on your, uh, on your countertop. Um, and there's only one public video of uh, physical damage of, of, of big equipment. And so we'll, uh, we'll hit that one uh, real quick. And this one came out, uh, came out a few, uh, few months ago, which actually was a, uh, was a leak um, by... Uh, um, by DHS and and uh, wasn't meant to be uh, wasn't meant to be public when it was filmed. Um.
So in, uh, um, in this particular video, then, uh, um, um, this was a, uh, um, a diesel, uh, diesel power uh, generator where the, uh, um, the researcher took control of the uh, generator and manipulated his control system to, uh, to cause a, a physical failure of the, a physical failure of the, uh, of the generator. Um, it's been uh, circulating for, uh, uh, for a while right now. Um, but uh, you know, watching generators jump up and down uh, are, are fun. But uh, are there uh, are there other cases of physically damaging equipment that uh, um, that you should be aware of when you're uh, when you're auditing these systems? Um, so this is a note uh, on DRM that uh, yeah <laughs> yes, DRM is the most evil thing ever. When you uh, when you make a couple of videos and you take them uh, on a different laptop to a conference, the video should actually play and not say please insert your key. Um, so, uh, so on the next couple of slides, I'm just going to talk a little about about these and not show uh, not show uh, um, some videos. Um, so, so these are just a couple of examples of physical damage to kind of get your uh, get your thoughts in uh, order. So this is the first one, which is a common thing that people start with when they start uh, um, investigating physical damage from uh, electronic control. Um, and the first one is water hammers. So uh, what a water hammer is is you have a static force um, or a static. Uh, um, chunk of a liquid um, in a pipe. Um, so if you apply a force to one end of it, uh, then uh, the uh, the water as it runs through the system will try and straighten any bends in the line. Um, so uh, like uh, this is a common thing you probably have underneath your house. So I don't know how many of you have old houses, and uh, when you uh, when you take a shower or whatever else, when you first crack the uh, um, when you first crack the the water, you hear this. Fotonk! Um, that's actually a water hammer. And so if you want to uh, destroy the plumbing in your house, you can actually do that by rhythmically turning on and off the faucet. So if you have one of those houses, so when you crack the water, you hear the, uh, the, the whack. You can sit there and go whack, 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 whack. And if you adjust the frequency just right, then uh, what's happening is the, in the bend in this pipe right here, the bend is trying to straighten as the water rushes through and hits the outside, uh, outside part of the bend. Um, and if you walk down into your basement, you can actually see the pipes start to rattle. Um, and so, uh, um, uh, so if you hit it uh, with enough stuff, then you can physically uh, damage the pipes. Eventually, the pipes will break or rip free from their uh, um, uh, from their moorings. So, in large systems, you can actually uh, boil water this way. Um, so, you can actually uh, you can actually buy commercial hot water heaters based on water hammers. So, in this commercial wa hot water heaters, you've got a big tank. Um, They've got a, uh, um, they've got a, uh, uh, basically a big uh, a sludge hammer type thing in the middle of it, and they sit there and they pound the water, and it'll heat the water up to a boil. Um, so in large systems, uh, you not only have to look at the physical damage of, uh, of, of pipes trying to straighten out that have bends in them, but you also have to look at the heat damage that can be caused um, as water goes back and forth. And you can do this experiment yourself um, at home, which there would have been a video of if DRM wasn't evil. Um, where uh, um, just take a, uh, a PVC pipe, uh, put a bend in it, um, say uh, make a 90 degree loop out of it, cap one, of, one and off, um, fill it full of water, and uh, sit there and smack it, uh, take a hammer or something and smack on the, end, the, the outside, end of the, uh, outside end of the pipe. Um, hit it you know, a few dozen times and measure the temperature of the water. And the water will actually heat up inside of the, uh, inside the pipe with a water hammer. Um, so uh, the next one that uh, um, most people usually hit uh, hit pretty fast is to try and uh, run motors to to run motors to uh, failure, um, and that's actually a lot harder than it sounds. Um, the motor manufacturers um, have a lot of people that uh, really like to stress their motors in, in in various and fun ways. And so most of the time, if you actually buy a motor, you stick it on the table and you hook into the control system. You sit there and flip it from forward to reverse a whole bunch of times. It'll jump off of the table and flip around and spin around, and it's all uh, really fun and, uh, and interesting to watch. But most of the time, you don't actually get to break the motor. The motors are built strong enough that uh, that actually doesn't cause physical damage to the motor itself. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, motors are gen generally turning a load. Um, so uh, if you have a motor hooked up to a large load and the lo load is uh, the load is spinning and in motion and you come over there and say motor reverse forward reverse forward reverse forward um, then a lot of times the the motor will self-destruct and uh, um, and smoke will leak out and um, and there will be lots of uh, lots of smoke and stuff so uh, um, so what I uh, started doing was uh, trying to classify physical damage into categories of, uh, of damage that, uh, that, that happened from, uh, from control system uh, attacks. 
And so this is kind of the uh, classification framework I came up with. I'm not sure if I'm going to uh, believe it for for very long, but uh, this is currently my uh, uh, my thoughts on the uh, on the issue. And the first one is inertial attacks. Um, you find a lot of uh, physical damage when you uh, start looking at uh, um, looking at uh, um, at auditing a process. Um, so when you're in, in there looking at a process, saying, you know, how could somebody physically damage this process? What is the what is the worst case scenario that can come out of this? Um, because probably one of your recommendations when you're looking at phys physical damage is is to try and put some physical controls on. Um, on this stuff. So uh, inertial attacks are heavy stuff, doesn't like to speed up or slow down. So if you have any, uh, uh, in the process, you have any large spinning, uh, spinning items and you can control them, the speed up and down really fast. Um, it's an easy way to make, uh, um, make equipment fail. Um, larger processes uh, are uh, much more likely to be accelerated to failure than small processes. Um, exclusion attacks. Um, there's actually a lot of these uh, across a lot of different industries. Um, in exclusion attacks, um, then you have uh, stuff that's not supposed to happen at the, uh, um, at the same time. Um, so uh, one good example of exclusion attack too that uh, um, I always like to use because everybody can, can relate to what it does is uh, one of my first SCADA systems I worked with um, was actually a cheese making uh, plant. And so uh, what would happen is milk and culture and sugar and all that fun stuff, we put in a big vat and uh, um, and a, uh, a paddle would come over there and stir it, and it would uh, it, it, it would uh, um, the, bac the bacteria would grow until it made cheese curd. And then uh, once there was enough cheese curd in it, then it got pushed out and filtered and turned into cheese you got to eat. Um, so after it got pushed out, then uh, some sprays would come on and automatically, and the wipers would come down and start scrubbing out the tank um, in preparation for the next batch of whey. So a uh, typical exclusion attack is where things are, gen are, are designed into a process, but not designed to happen at the same time. So in this case, we'd make bubbly cheese, which would probably taste awful. Um, resonance attack. So uh, resonance attacks mo happen mostly in electric power and water distribution. Um, so uh, in resonance attacks, small variations in uh, current or flow um, are conserved as a standing wave in the system. Um, so. Uh, uh, by continuing to uh, to change these small va variations, you can increase the size of the standing wave until the size of the standing wave overpowers the system. Um, so this is actually one of the hardest types of attacks to pull off remotely, because a lot of times you don't have the the moment-to-moment -moment data you need to pull off a resonance attack. Um, so uh, exam good examples of places where resonance attacks occurs are say uh, say transformers. Um, if you take uh, leads and you hook them onto a transformer on the output, um, and then you leads on the input. Um, when you apply power to one side of the transformer, power doesn't immediately come on on the other side of the transformer. The transformer stores energy for you. So as, the, as you apply power to one side, then uh, the coils in the transformer charge up and you'll see a, a gradual charge up to, uh, to voltage on the other side of the transformer. Likewise, when you cut power, it doesn't instantly, uh, uh, instantly go down. Um, so uh, one example of that is, um, you can look at this in your, your laptop power supplies. So you've got your laptop power supply plugged into the wall, and it's got the green LED on the side. When you pull the, uh, when you pull the power supply out of, the, out of the, uh, the wall, then the LED just slowly goes off. And this is an example of reson uh, where you can find resonance in the system. So by manipulating, it, the, uh, um, uh, by manipulating the power up and down um, on the internal parts of the, uh, of, of the system, um, then uh, you can get uh, um, you can get a standing wave and by increasing the uh, incre increasing the amplitude of the standing wave. Eventually, you drive the component past its uh, its rated value. Um, wear attacks are also really common. Um, components have a finite lifespan, and uh, manipulating the controls can often um, significantly reduce the lifespan. Um, so uh, one uh, good example of this is uh, um, if you have a car with a clutch and you drive around with the clutch only 90% engaged all, all the time, you'll actually be able to drive around. Your car will work just fine, but you'll be replacing the clutch in a couple of months. Other cases of this are, are things like, say, conveyor belts. If you can time so that the, uh, the cutter on the conveyor belt hits exactly the same spot every time, you'll wear through the conveyor belt at, a, at an accelerated rate. And uh, surge attacks. This is kind of the send all the gas there now, uh, now attack. So uh, um, continuous systems are designed only to handle a certain amount of uh, product at a time. Um, and exceeding those, uh, those uh, limits can cause physical damage. Um, a good example are, are, are mixers. 
So if you have a big mixer in the process and it's designed to be filled up 20% and then it sits there and mixes stuff um, uh, like it's supposed to and then dumps it out the bottom, if you fill the mixer up to uh, uh, fill, fill the mixer up to uh, 100% and then turn the mixer on, then stuff will come out the top. Um, um, this is a uh, pretty good example of a uh, surge attack. Actually, one of the uh, one of the first uh, um, first systems we actually got to play with, um, uh, fall out and do as much physical damage as we wanted to was a uh, a pilot plant. A pilot plant had been uh, had been built uh, uh, to uh, take a mixed uh, mixed radioactive and chemical waste and treat it and turn it just into uh, radioactive waste. Obviously, there was no radioactive stuff in the pilot plant. It was just there to to test the uh, um, uh, to to test the chemical processes. So uh, the the pilot plant was uh, was 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 built, um, and then a larger version was built. So right when the pilot plant was shut down, then. Uh, um, then we pretty much popped in there and says, "Hey, before you tear this tear this place down, we would really, really like to uh, uh, to play with this thing." Um, so, uh, uh, so we, we we popped in, started uh, started looking at it, and the first thing we noticed is there was an unencrypted wireless access point plugged into uh, to the side. So we decided that that was this way 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 too easy to hack in. So we ripped that out. Um, that was actually there because the um, uh, the guys actually used a tablet PC to take notes on their uh, on their readings, and the tablet PC didn't support web. And so they had uh, they plugged in an unencrypted wireless access point, and they ran around and they took notes. Um, so, uh, but the, we actually got a pretty good surge attack out of it. Um, so one of the first things we found when we started playing with the system, after we got it got there, was that uh, the pumps filling uh, filling the holding tanks at the top of the process um, could, were uh, uh, could pump stuff in faster than the drain at the bottom of the tanks could uh, could handle it. So uh, we filled it filled it full of stimulant, um, cranked the pumps out uh, up all the way, and the tanks came over there and flo overflowed over the top of the tanks. Um, unfortunately, they said the engineers had put a bunch of the uh, the actual electrical operating equipment below these holding tanks at the top of the uh, the top of the thing that were gravity fed and lots of stuff shorted out. Um, latent abilities are one that uh, ones that uh, uh, you find a lot, but uh, nobody expects them to be there. Um, so building customized components for your process is actually really expensive. If you have to go down to a manufacturer and say, build this one for me, just for me, then the price tag get, goes up uh, exponentially. So whenever possible, when people are building, um, uh, are building a process, they use off-the-shelf components. And off-the-shelf components are generally manufactured with more than one purpose in mind. Um, and uh, the other, but the other purposes are actually still there latent in the, uh, the component. And so if you've got the component plugged in um, to uh, kind of plugged into an intelligent controller, then all of those extra abilities are still still available to you. Um, uh, one of the, one of the uh, latent abilities that you find really uh, really often is in motors. So uh, the motors plugged in, the motors are meant to run want run in one direction, but the manufacturer manufactures this not for that particular purpose, um, and the motor is reversible. And so the the process engineer that plugged it in, tested it, um, always ran the motor in, in in forward. But the motor's capable of running in reverse. And so you can get uh, you can get a lot of physical damage in process just by looking for and exploiting latent abilities in the in the actual field equipment itself. Um, so uh, um, so I sometimes forget that most uh, security people don't have a, a good understanding of process control systems. So uh, I'm going to do uh, um, kind of process control and architecture in three slides. Um, so uh, if it doesn't make sense after that, then please uh, um, please tell tell me. So this is uh, this is kind of the the basic simplest process control um, setup that you can do. Um, so uh, you have an operator's console, and the operator's console is where the guy that runs this thing sits. sits. It's got uh, usually graphical sc screens that lay out the process in front of him. And he sits down and uh, monitors temperature, that type of stuff. Um, if he's got to start off a new batch or make an adjustment, he clicks on a thing, makes an adjustment, clicks on another thing, and, uh, and it runs. Um, usually, uh, and the operator's console is almost always um, manned 24 hours a day uh, if the plant runs 24 hours a day. And then you have the engineer's workstation. The engineer's workstation is actually the most privileged box on the system. That's where the guy that actually designed the physical process, the, uh, the chemical engineer, the mechanical engineer, the electrical engineer, um, sat down and built the software, cobbled it together um, to, uh, uh, to display all the screens for the operator and make the operator run. Um, the engineer's workstation actually has uh, the ability to debug the process. So when you put together a physical process, just like when you put together software, it has to be debugged. So uh, um, just like when you uh, stick, a, a, you know, you stick SSL combined with a with a bunch of uh, cert checking, and you say you run, then usually 
five or six times that your software blows up and you, uh, you curse the developers and you read the documentation some more. And then finally you get to your, uh, your process to run. Um, the same thing happens in a physical process. When you engineer a physical process, stuff doesn't work exactly like you wanted it to. The cutter comes down and it's supposed to cut the stuff, but it usually but it leaves a little tag on the end. Well, that messes up your process. You've got to go and de debug that and change the speed of the cut, the angle of the cut, or some, some, uh, some other type of thing. So the engineer's workstation is generally privileged to call out to all the embedded systems and say, turn this pump on because I said so. I'm debugging the process. You know, I'm God. Just do it. Um, and the engineer's workstation is usually powered on, but usually not manned, because the engineer isn't there um, unless something's wrong with the process. Um, then you have your various and sundry application servers, middleware, that type of stuff, until you finally hit your first, uh, first chunk of communication equipment. So if you're in, uh, in say, uh, the chemical industry, that type of stuff, the communication equipment is, just has a very short, uh, short hop over to the stuff that, uh, that actually controls your process. If you're in like electrical power, water distribution, that type of stuff, you've got a bunch of long haul communication lines that's gonna run out um, to uh, run out to your field equipment out in the field because that's where stuff actually happens. And everything beyond that is embedded systems and they come in all shapes and flavors and, uh, um, and, uh, um, and types. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll cover field network. So uh, for those of you that, that, that don't know, which was about, uh, about uh, two thirds of the room there, a PLC is a programmable logic controller and this is used in most, uh, in, in most industries. Um, and this was, uh, uh, this actually handles the nuts and bolts of running the process, the if statements of the, uh, of, of the process. Um, so uh, um, if you go way back in history to before there were PLCs, processes were actually programmed with a bunch of cables. Um, has it, I, everybody's probably seen the old 1950s movies where they have the operator. She's got a whole bunch of cables around her, around her neck and a big pegboard in front of her. Um, when somebody wanted to make a phone call, they'd call the operator and she'd plug a line of the pegboard and plug another line into a different pegboard. Um, a circuit would be created and you got to talk to, uh, got to, talk to somebody out else. Um, original processes were actually programmed that way. They'd run all of the leads off the process into a big chunk of pegboard. And then you would take a, a, an AND block that was labeled as an AND block and stick it onto the board. You take your cable and you plug it into the two AND blocks and plug it into the out, uh, out blocks. If you had some sort of variable measurement like a, um, you know, a speed or something like that, it would come into the board, you'd plug, a, you'd plug one of your logic blocks in there and it would have a, uh, have a pot on there and you turn the variable resistor on the pot and uh, you could set the levels or the, uh, or the speeds that stuff would happen at. Um, and that's actually been moved forward all the way into modern PLCs. So modern PLCs are actually programmed graphically. So uh, in order to program the PLC, you grab a whole bunch of AND and OR blocks and whatnot, and you drag them on the screen and you drag a line to the, to the AND and OR block and you program your process that way. And it's still done that way today. Um, so if you look here, then uh, this is a, a couple of runs of ladder logic, um, although uh, since red isn't coming through, you don't get to see the other ones. So in this, uh, run, in this uh, chunk of ladder logic, if you're not familiar with it, then uh, um, uh, this says that if x1 is on and y1 is on because they're in parallel and, not, and x2 is off, then turn y1 off. And so uh, as programmers, we find this really arcane and hard, to, uh, and hard to deal with. But process engineers like it, it's quick to change, and they can see kind of what's going on. Ladder logic is scanned from the top to the bottom. So in this case, if Y1 is turned off um, as, a, as an output, you can see Y1 is actually reused as an input um, during the next scan cycle. So the next time it comes around, then uh, Y1 will be off and the circuit will be closed. Um, and it's scanned from top to bottom however many times a second. The more, the, the more ladder logic you stick in there, each, each if statement is basically called a rung of ladder logic, and the more ladder logic you stick in there, the longer it takes to scan from top to bottom. Um, and uh, so all these embedded controllers are, are uh, stuck together with field networking. And uh, field networking is not your mother's TCP IP um, Ethernet network. Um, so each manufacturer kind of has his own his own field networking with his uh, with his own network cables and his own network protocols, and it's been built up by that manufacturer over time. And a lot of the, uh, and pretty much all the time, these are closed standards. You can't go down and read a spec on the field networking, uh, and you can only buy the cable from them. So this purple stuff is actually a Profibus cable, and it runs about twenty bucks a foot. And this is what you cable your uh, um, uh, this is what you cable your uh, your PLCs together with. Um, so inside the PLC is, is a flat memory model. 
Uh, so, uh, and all the PLCs share a flat memory model. So when you slap in a new card that reads some, uh, reads some analog points off of, a, off of a speed or sets some, digi uh, sets some digital points, you know, pumps, valves, whatever, then uh, those are actually mapped into, into the shared memory segment. And in most of these protocols, you actually have to know the mapping in order to make sense of it, because the protocol itself only does bulk reads and writes from memory. So in this case, if we've got four bytes over here that are interpreted as an analog voltage, we just have to know, um, if we're just looking at the CPU memory, we just have to know that uh, those four bytes happen to, uh, to, uh, to represent an analog value, and uh, the other two bytes are a, a bit mask that uh, correspond to a bunch of, uh, a bunch of field equipment. Um, and this is actually shared across uh, all the PLCs. So if you write a value into the memory on one PLC, it's reflected in the memory of all the other PLCs. And this purple networking core has a protocol for synchronizing the memory between, all, between them. So uh, this, is, uh, this is all good, but, uh, um, but we probably don't have a uh, process engineer sitting around pointing out all the weaknesses in the system. Uh, probably if you go up and you say, hey, how can you uh, physically break my system? Then, uh, um, then the process engineer is probably not going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, what you need to do is flip that and flip that and flip that and everything will go boom. Um, so uh, uh, we've got to do discovery of the, uh, discovery of the process. Um, and uh, equipment also doesn't come with a manual on how to physically damage it. Um, equipment is manufactured to specs that try and prevent physical damage. Um, it's actually much harder, than, uh, um, much harder than you think to actually get past all of that and physically damage the, um, uh, physically damage the system. So uh, you either have to uh, find the weak points or guess. But uh, guessing can be surprisingly effective. So what you probably already have. Um, so this is a screenshot of, uh, uh, of an HMI. This is, the, this is what's displayed on the operator's console all the time. He looks at it, there's various screens. He can drill down, drill back, but it shows him the state of the system and what's going on. So probably as an attacker, before you get to the damage stage of it, you've already completed your discovery phase, which means you've hacked onto the operator's console or into the engineer's workstation, grabbed these files and pulled them back and reverse engineered them. Um, uh, so uh, you kind of have a map of the uh, a map of the process. You should know most of what's going on um, and how to talk to it. So uh, the first stage you can do is start analyzing the ladder logic for uh, uh, for clues. So uh, um, so uh, in modern systems, actually most of the safety of the process is dependent on the logic in the controllers. Um, so it's it's very very expensive to put uh, physical physical controls into your process. So if you, uh, if you want to make sure that this boiler never gets above 72 degrees, um, what uh, people used to do is uh, wire a wire up to, uh, up to the burner and up to a temperature controller, and uh, that physical wire would, would shut down the process at seven, uh, shut down the burner at 72 degrees. It was uh, physical safety built into the system. That's actually expensive, and uh, now people retool a lot. So if you're a plastic manufacturer uh, and you make plastic for cell phones, they, uh, your your uh, customer may change his model of cell phones four times a year, which is going to require you to retool your 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 process four times a year. And so, uh, since you've got to retool a lot, a lot of the logic, the safety logic, gets moved into the controllers. So, uh, analyzing the logic uh, tell, the, the logic uh, um, tells you a lot about what the engineer was worried about. So, uh, pretty much, uh, you can start at the master stop uh, run. Um, and all roads that uh, that uh, that lead to the uh, um, lead to the master stop are generally interesting. Um, so uh, the the uh, logic in the controller um, can be downloaded from the controller as soon as you can talk to it, um, and uh, they can be labeled any number of things, but lots of them are human readable. So let's take a look at this run, rung of uh, ladder logic. This is a uh, this is a good uh, candidate for an exclusion uh, uh, attack. The engineer wanted to make sure that a motor wasn't running at the same time a valve was closed. So if you're looking in uh, kind of the ladder logic notation over here, M7 means motor number seven, wherever that went, um, and HV is a valve of some sort. So uh, the ladder logic uh, here says um, says that uh, um, if the motor is on. Um, and the valve, is, uh, if the motor is on and the valve is open, then stop. Um, we don't want to run this process anymore. It, uh, it goes to the master stop. So probably this is a candidate for an exclusion attack. If we, uh, uh, if we have control of this process, then the obvious thing to do is to force the points high using the debug calls and turn the motor and the valve, valve on at the same time. Um, so uh, here's another example of, uh, uh, of discovery inside the ladder logic itself. Um, in this case, the, uh, the engineer has put in a uh, level sensor, 
and uh, there's no scaling here, so you don't know exactly what the uh, um, exactly what the uh, the level sensor uh, um, goes to or what it uh, what it reads. The scaling is probably done back at the computer, and you probably uh, um, uh, you've probably already grabbed those files, reverse engineered them, and so you know what the scaling actually means. So in this case, you've got uh, um, a level sensor, and if that level is greater than or equal to 17, then uh, shut down to the master stop. So this is probably some sort of tank or, or some sort of thing that can overflow. Um, and uh, as it fills up, the level meter will go, will, will go up until it reaches level 17, and then the, ma the process will be forcibly shut down. Um, uh, so uh, in this case, we could, uh, since, uh, since uh, we can force points, since we can talk to the controller um, as evidence that we actually have the ladder logic, then uh, we can force the, point, uh, force the point high or change the set point so it's greater than 17. Um, so here's, a, here's one for an operator's console that uh, is a good candidate for a surge, a surge attack. So uh, in this one, um, then, uh, um, then we've got uh, a couple of pumps Reading, leading into a reactor. And so probably if you see a system like this, then the first pump is normally, uh, normally in charge of, of, uh, of filling the reactor. But they the engineer probably later retrofitted it because the pump wasn't powerful enough and put another pump in par parallel to fill the reactor. So uh, one of the things you have to ask is if the, uh, um, is, uh, if the engineer planned for both pumps to be on full blast at the same time. And uh, can you overload the reactor by just kicking on both pumps and running them at full blast? So, uh, um, so after uh, after your discovery, and uh, you can't figure out uh, figure out the physical uh, physical damage uh, stuff, then uh, um, then the attacker is is, is pretty much going to have to guess. Um, so, uh, um, if you're doing an audit of a control system and looking for looking for the physical attacks that can happen, then uh, um, then you you really need to think about um, how the attacker is going to guess and what he could po possibly guess. And so one of the, one of the way of guessing a lot of things is to uh, is to fuzz the uh, fuzz the the control protocol just like you would fuzz uh, a protocol looking for buffer overflows. Only on the other end of it, then you have physical devices turning on and off. This is also really expensive. So uh, um, so I doubt that. Uh, I doubt that whoever's employing you to to look at the network is going to uh, is going to let you sit there and just randomly turn stuff on and off. Um, so, uh, but looking for uh, looking for attacks, then pretty much uh, you take you test a control point, look for indications, and maximize those indications. And uh, I apologize for lines that don't show up here because. Um, there's something wrong with the uh, projector stuff, but uh, anyway. So if you look at the square wave here, that's actually uh, would actually be a point that I have control of. So you grab one of the points and you exercise the point over a series of time, and then look at the values you get back from the system. So uh, as the values come back from the system, you'll see a series of peaks, and the rise and fall of those peaks um, will vary um, according to whatever they're uh, whatever they're measuring. But a bunch of them should come up and down at uh, at the same time. So if you're turned if you're energizing some uh, part of the system, then lots of stuff will come online at the same time. But the uh, the peaks will vary in uh, in amplitude, duration, and the uh, the beginning of the uh, the beginning of the start time. So uh, pretty much what you do um, looking for the indications is uh, is you find multiple points uh, or one point that uh, um, that affects a particular value that you that you want to maximize because through your discovery you you've decided that uh, that you want to maximize it. So uh, if there's delay, you can turn on and off the points trying to maximize the delay. If more than one point um, more than one point affects a an observed value, then you can manipulate both uh, both uh, points in the combinatoric in order to maximize the maximize the spike. Um, so, uh, yes, so if uh, two people produce the uh, work on the same uh, value. So uh, um, fast moving valid, uh, values uh, more often lead to breakage than slow moving values. So if you get a bunch of, uh, a bunch of data um, and you see a bunch of fast moving data, uh, fast moving values, uh, values in it, then uh, you should probably uh, look at those first. Um, but uh, don't get stuck on a single peak. So uh, often breakage occurs when you where, where you least least expect it. So uh, um, if you're testing testing a uh, a service for potential breakage, then uh, then don't don't get stuck on the uh, one peak and continue moving through the process. 
Um, so engineers try to take, in, take into account all the things that can go wrong in a process, um, and they're actually pretty good at it. Um, so uh, if you go in and, uh, and you hit a system and expect it to be like the, the 1990, uh, 1991 and buffer overflows have just been discovered, then uh, it's, uh, it's, actually, uh, it's actually much harder to find physical damage than, uh, than, than you would think. Um, but this is uh, no different than searching for a buffer overflow in a code. You've got a set of inputs. Um, you manipulate the set of inputs and watch the uh, and watch the outputs coming uh, coming for it. And so what you're looking for really is something that the engineer missed um, that uh, that you can exploit to uh, um, to take over it. Um, so uh, where do we have to be? So uh, um, in, in the uh, in the network. So how deep into the network you have to hack depends on two factors. Um, how fast you need to manipulate a point, and what layers of system perform sanity checks. Um, so most of the time, the engineer can't manipulate a, a process to failure. So if he sits down at his, the operator's console and say, chunk, 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 there's enough logic built in between the operator's console and the, the actual functioning of the system to stop him from shooting himself in the foot. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so uh, anything you need to do has to be beyond whatever sanity checks are going to stop you. Um, the second one is is how fast you have to be. Typically, the further you are you out in the uh, out, out are out on the network, then uh, the slower your reaction time. So if you're at the end of a TCP session um, through three layers of middleware, you know you might have a three millisecond round trip time. If you're trying to maximize an indication of where uh, where it goes up, uh, rises and falls in some fraction of a millisecond, um, then you uh, you're not fast enough. You're not close enough. So uh, uh, pretty much you have the potential for hardware damage wherever you are in the network, um, on all the embedded controllers, in the PLCs, on the field network devices, um, or all the way up into the, uh, the traditional chunks of the, uh, the network equipment. So, uh, um, so for the defenders, um, one of the things that the defenders have, uh, have going for them um, is that physical damage isn't instantaneous. And uh, um, hackers don't have a uh, have a perfect knowledge of the process when they get into when they get into uh, to your system. So as the uh, as the uh, um, hacker gets into your system, he's going to go around, start manipulating points, look for look for the spikes, look for uh, all the uh, the stuff he can he can do. Um, and uh, um, and the the uh, defenders um, have a chance of actually looking for or noticing that. So if uh, they start noticing things turning on and off when they shouldn't, then probably they're going to go look for that. And as far as I know, there's no experimental data in existence looking at the response time of the defenders. Um, how, long would, how long and how messed up does the process have to be for the defenders actually um, start to start looking at it? Um, so one of the uh, things on the plus size for the uh, the uh, for the attacker is that attackers can easily change the display the state of the display. All these protocols are unencrypted. A simple art man in the middle um, will allow you to spoof the operator's console, um, and uh, that's actually usually pretty easy to pull uh, to uh, pull off. The other downside for the uh, um, the defenders are generally they're in noise controlled uh, noise controlled rooms because OSHA, OSHA regulations. Mm -hmm. um, Say that you have to be in a noise-controlled room so you don't get hearing loss. Um, so, uh, so uh, people have posited that uh, the attackers may be able to do some sort of diversionary tactics and keep the uh, uh, keep the defenders busy. But uh, as far as I know, that's never been observed in the wild. So, uh, pretty much, uh, why why do we study physical damage? Um, because the uh, the assumption uh, uh, in a lot of cases that this, the attacker will be stopped at the firewall. That are the, the 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 cyber defenses will be effective. We'll find him. We'll get him out of his network, uh, our network, before uh, um, uh, uh, before he does any harm. So, uh, uh, because we got uh, we have case studies now of uh, people getting through it. Um, then uh, we need to reevaluate the reevaluate the model and consider uh, um, what's the maximum damage that the attacker can do to a process. Um, uh, how much physical damage can can really be done, um, and uh, start to re-implementing physical controls on the process to stop the uh, um, uh, to stop the attackers from doing um, you know really bad stuff. Um, so generally, and for most processes, the worst case uh, scenario is is physical damage. And so hopefully, um, as we we look uh, uh, we look and we start uh, playing with uh, with physically damaging stuff, then uh, we can come up with a, a, a better uh, a better litmus test and, and a better body of work on what's prudent uh, physical uh, protection against physical damage um, in a process.
So uh, that uh, pretty much brings me to the end. I think I went through a little bit fast, so uh, um, ah, it's about 4.15, not too bad. Um, so uh, questions? Oh, yes. Yes, um, so I, I probably should have mentioned that. There's two industries that you almost find no physical damage cases in. One is nuclear, the other is in uh, nox noxious gas production. Um, when, uh, when, they built, uh, when they built nukes, then uh, um, nukes actually had to pass tests for uh, basically the, the operator goes insane and starts trying to, trying to manipulate things to failure. Um, and so the physics of the plant um, have already been tested before the plant was ever built. Um, yes, that was that was actually my old my old uh, lab. Um, so there there was the case that uh, um, <laughs> um, so uh, there was the case where uh, where where uh, uh, some guys uh, tried uh, tried to uh, um, well both of them were having a or were were were, uh, were having relations with the same woman. So that uh, that that pro is usually never a uh, um, never a good thing. And so uh, then they were both assigned to the same shift, uh, pulling rods out of the top of a reactor and. So bad stuff happened. Um, so uh, um, although no radiation was was uh, was released, um, same thing in uh, um, same uh, same thing in noxious gas. And both of those then in the control systems, you've got the control system has two parts: has the control system and the safety system. The safety system um, is uh, is uh, in in uh, reactors is a physically isolated system um, that just sits there, and its job is to say no. If anything gets out of whack, it shuts the place down. Um, so uh, in, in noxious gas, then it's not required to be physically isolated, but still does a pretty good ch uh, job of monitoring everything that could possibly go wrong and shutting it down um, because, you know, we don't want those things to go haywire and, and cause, uh, cause uh, damage to people. Um, Oh, the PLCs on the run program switch. That's actually a uh, um, something I uh, um, I do in a different presentation, but it's a good question. So a lot of PLCs actually do have a, a key on the front, um, and in order to to change the ladder logic, then uh, you ha it has to be in the program mode. Uh, most PLCs you find in the field actually are left in the program mode all the time, because otherwise the uh, uh, the engineer has to physically send somebody there to turn the key from run to program. Um, and PLC works perfectly well in pro in program mode. So if you if you go back to run mode, um, if you go back to run mode, depending on the PLC, sometimes you can still force points, which which says you know kick the pump on because I said so on the engineer, I can do what I want. Other PLCs in the run mode um, don't allow you to force points. Um, the ones that uh, still allow you to force point in the run mode, you can add a rung, rung of ladder logic that says check to see if any points are forced, and if any points are forced, then then shut the place down, um, which is becoming a more common control in in there. So the attacker can't just sit there and and force it. You can still change the set points for it. So for things like overflowing tanks and stuff like that, if the set point is if it's above 17, then those set points are still settable. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, as an attacker, if you can force points, then what you would do is just force force the all stop to off. Um, the network does, but uh, in uh, in process control, uh, most of these protocols are undocumented. Um, so uh, and the and most of the time the attacker is sending a properly formatted com uh, a properly formatted command. So yes, you could write an IDS to look for to look for a force point and and send an alert, which is probably actually a, a good idea. Um, but you'd have to but uh, nobody's reverse engineered the pro protocols. And uh, in the cases where the protocols have been reverse engineered, there've been a lot of lawsuits where people have reverse engineered them for them for compatibility, so they could make it a cheaper controller that uh, that replaced a more expensive company's controller. And so uh, you probably have some shaky legal, legal ground on uh, on using your reverse engineered protocol to inspect packets. Oh, yep. Um, so, so uh, yes, uh, power companies do have have things where they can just uh, where they can dial in and and uh, and and change stuff. Um, so, uh, so if you're looking at it, that's that's kind of a regional reliability type stuff, um, and uh, a lot of that is not uh, is not terribly automatic. Um, so. Uh, 
um, but uh, um, but yes, yeah, so a lot of times you can like uh, it just say like, dial the dial up the uh, um, dial up the the RTU at the substation and tell it to to uh, to shut stuff off. Um, but uh, um, but I don't know if that answered your question directly or. Oh yes. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, espionage inside uh, sectors like the uh, um, like electric power, um, then uh, if one mil if one malicious uh, power company can cause uh, can cause uh, the one one utility can maliciously cause the other utility um, to uh, to to misreport um, to misreport or take a take an action, then there's actually a financial incentive to do that. Um, so yes, that is that is true, um, and uh, there is one case in the case study. Um, uh, the case study that looks like that happened. Um, so uh, there's there's one case study where there was actually a forged buy order in the power trading system, um, where somebody had forged the order in order to basically corner the market for uh, for a little bit of time and make a bunch of stuff. But the the order was actually so so uh, humongously huge that uh, the people uh, the, the people ignored the order. Um, so was that was that kind of your question on uh, um, utilities attacking each other? Oh, it wasn't? My question was regarding just a radio plant that produces some aluminum product or a pump station. Uh huh. Um, actually, that uh, that has been done. Um, so uh, in a uh, it, not in power, but in a water system. So so pretty much the the power companies sometimes have have limited control over heavy uh, um, heavy heavy usage guys, um, so that they can remotely turn it down. Um, one of the things they want uh, remotely turn the power off. One of the things they want is also um, the ability to, to remotely turn off everybody's um, air conditioner, and they'll pay you they'll give you a, a price break so that they can turn off all the air conditioners during peak usage. We haven't that that uh, that that attack is being looked into, um, but we haven't seen it yet. The only place we've actually seen it is actually in a water company, um, where they had a, a similar thing during uh, during uh, peak water usage. Um, then uh, they could uh, take some of their biggest water consumers and tell them not to manufacture. And for the ability to uh, to, to level off their water usage, then uh, they would give those guys a, a cost break on the water. Um, and uh, in that case, what they had was a PLC, and the two companies shared data points on the PLC. So this guy would write some, and this guy would read some. And somebody from the outside got into uh, got into uh, one to one half of the agreement and wrote the values uh, there um, without authorization and caused the shutdown of the other half. Um, so the, there was enough forensic evidence to to know whether that was uh, just a, an operator that uh, um, that decided to do it or. Um, or or a, or a hacker, but uh, uh, but it does look like uh, the operators were all accounted for at the time. So and what they were doing were accounted for at the time. So that kind of leaves you with the with the attacker. Huh? Oh, uh, can can you can you spoof the uh, can you can you spoof the automated meter readers to make it look like you're producing power so they'll pay you? Uh, yes, that has been done and prosecuted many times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh yes, so if you want to if you wanted to uh, yeah you could induce that. Yeah, so you can clip on alligator attacks, uh, alligator clips and uh, and whatnot and uh, uh, and uh, and. I, I've never heard of anybody being framed for uh, for manipulating somebody else's stuff, but uh, that would be an interesting attack. Yes. So um, it looks like they're uh, they're flashing me that we're just about out of time. So uh, um, so uh, thanks for listening and.